Here we go. Well, Douglas, thank you very much indeed for your time. We last spoke in November, and mm. there's been a tremendous reception amongst uh, people who access uh, our conversations in this country to what you had to say. It's, it's travelled far and wide. But the reason for following up quickly, apart from the fact that you're a tremendous uh, company and a great conversationist, is that in that short time, the world has changed beyond belief. At the, you were celebrating, or we were celebrating, the extraordinary reception of your book, The Madness of Crowds, in which you talked about the way we'd upturned the stool of liberalism and we're trying to create a society on some very unstable uh, uh, upturned legs of that stool. Uh, we had Brexit raging, uh, but since then, the whole Brexit outlook has completely changed. Formally, you've left. There's been an election which produced an extraordinary result. Uh, we, but we now have something that's changing the way we live in the short term and likely to massively alter it for decades ahead. And if we get it wrong, we'll do permanent damage, I think, to the global liberal order and to our economic future. And sadly, the other thing I'd love to touch on is the death of a very good friend of yours, the loss, I think, to us all, of uh, Sir Roger Scruton. But if we could come to coronavirus first, can you give us a European perspective uh, on what's happening, uh, particularly in London and across Europe? Yes, I mean, it's, uh, we're speaking, I think, uh, you know, pretty early still in this crisis, but at the time in which the seriousness of it has now become clear to, I think, everybody or everybody but a very small number of, of people. Uh, the government in Britain, like other countries, has had to take extraordinary measures. And we've seen announcements that I think most of us would not expect it to have ever seen in our lives. Uh, Prime Minister is telling uh, everybody over the age of seven to lock themselves in their homes for foreseeable future. Uh, encouraging no more than two people to gather in any one place, uh, encouraging us all to keep a distance from each other in our societies and much more. And and uh, th these are things which uh, very few people were thinking about until only a few weeks ago. I I'm extremely reluctant to make any prognostications on it uh, and remain very silent on the whole issue because uh, I, I do believe in expertise and there are a relatively small number of people who have spent a lot of time, indeed their lives, studying pandemics and virus uh, virology. And I think that these, these moments are moments of incredible testing, among other things, for society. And they are the moments when we not only have to acknowledge our um, humility and recognize that humility, but draw upon what reserves we have. And by that, I mean the reserves of, of resilience and courage and fortitude and more, which will be among the only things that will make sure we get through a crisis like this. There's very little that most of us can do other than follow the government advice and the scientists advice. Some people decide they would like to cavil with that and, and, as I say, hold themselves out as having some other expertise. Or some people are still, of course, um, still fighting political battles uh, through the prism of coronavirus, you know, pro or anti-Trump, how are you doing? Pro or anti-Brexit, how are the Boris doing? And I feel very sorry for these people as well, as I say, I can't help saying there's a certain degree of contempt because a moment like this is a moment when everything changes and we get to remember what it's like uh, to go through history. So in terms of what ordinary citizens can do, you know, stay calm and carry on, was, uh, I don't think the poster was ever actually put up around England, but we all sort of mm. recognise what it said about England in the darkest days of the 40s. Mm. The massive cultural changes that have taken place since then you've just touched on it, how much of that resilience, that willingness to pull together in the face of a crisis, do you think uh, can still be drawn out in Great Britain today? Well, we'll see, like with every country. I, I have a tiny um, uh, feeling which I, I try to bat away of uh, 
um, the, the feeling of sort of, uh, in a way, pleasure at seeing uh, a cliche slightly fall apart. I always thought that keep calm and carry on as a sort of an aggravating cliche for a nation to think of itself as having, because I thought for a long time it sort of had been slipping away, shall we say. I think that Britain is no different from any other country in a way. We'll, we'll see, as I say, like, as Australia will, what our, what our personal resilience is like. But it's, it's, it's not going to be easy for people because there's such a, a degree of sort of passivity about it. There are a lot of things we should not do. But uh, it's, it's very hard for a lot of people to know what they can do. There are enormous cruelties about this virus. The cruelty of uh, encouraging people to be basically uh, wary, suspicious um, of other people, of having to distance ourselves from our, our neighbours uh, rather than draw close to them. Uh, the horrible thing, which many of us have had, of our parents and their children not being able to touch each other, to hug each other. Uh, th these, are, these are meaningful, uh, um, personal cruelties. And we will all have to find a way uh, to get through that. And I would suggest that one way to do so is to put it in a kind of historical perspective and to say, if this is... Uh, a great test or even the great test of this age then we should consider ourselves relatively lucky because it hasn't come about through having to kill people uh, and it hasn't come about through war it's come about through something which commits us to a passivity but also demands a resilience of us which i hope we rise to like everyone else it has been i should say i should just add one thing has been enormously moving to see people across the world, and particularly for me and where I'm from, across the continent of Europe, uh, having to do things which they just were not expecting ever to have to do in their lives, and people celebrating the people who are showing resilience in that. You know, the people of Italy have suffered greatly in recent weeks, greatly. And uh, the thing that we want to talk about and do talk about rightly is not just the suffering, but the heroism which they've shown, both in their emergency services and their medical staff, but also of the people. You know, it's, it's the videos of the Italians standing on their balconies singing that have gone around the world. And that's, that's the, those are the things to hold on to, I think. I understand what you're saying. I'm actually, despite the fact that we've had some unfortunate imagery, our news was full of the news that uh, a brawl over the toilet paper in a supermarket had become a front page story in the Scandinavian newspapers. And that seemed pretty impressive. And it reflected poorly on what is happening in some quarters in Australia. Of, of all countries, we need not worry about the supply chain foodstuffs here. Yeah. Uh, exactly. Britain's farmers do a remarkable job of uh, Britain's two thirds self sufficient in food, which is remarkable for a country of 70 million people on an area that's about the same as the electorate I once represented in the federal parliament of Australia. Right, right. Part of the world. Uh, but uh, one of our most senior journalists, my, I'm referring to this very issue uh, last weekend, said that uh, this the cult of individual narcissism now goes on trial with mutual social support now a survival imperative. An interesting way of looking at it. My yeah. guess, right, the, the by and large, just as there were people who did the honourable thing in the First and Second World War and there were those who behaved very badly and very opportunistically, on balance, I think, Middle Britain uh, is probably the same as Middle Australia. They, they will be quite measured, calm and responsible in the face of all of this. I actually do think this will be a setback for the terrible narcissism that's blighted much of the sort of public way that people have behaved in, in recent times. Yes, it could do. I, I say I, I'm wary of making uh, predictions about such things because in my observation, everything can always go in any direction. Um, you know, I'm, I'm enormously fond of, uh, of a quote of the great Czech writer Milan Kundera 
who said in one of his late works, Testaments Betrayed, he says, the thing with mankind is that we operate in a fog. We, we stumble along a path and we, we find our way. Uh, the striking thing is not this. The striking thing is that when we look back, we see the man, we see the path, but we don't see the fog. What he's saying, of course, is that everything appears to be inevitable once you've got there, because you got there. And you forget the, the difficulty, the complexity, the impossibility of knowing where you're going to get to as you're going through it. And in that lies a very important humbling truth, which is, as I say, that some people will say, well, inevitably, this crisis will uh, diminish the cult of uh, individualism. Uh, but it is possible that it could have the opposite effect and that people might actually be more suspicious of their neighbour. They might be more wary of contact with other people. I imagine if, if this pandemic gets really bad, um, will people want to live in cities? Will they want to physically isolate themselves a bit more? That's possible as well. It's, it's incredibly important, I think, to look to the future. We don't know how this is going to unfold. And one of the greatest unknowns, frankly, is how much economic damage this will do. Yes. It's already very serious. That's impacting massively on people's lives. But at the end of this, there will be, I think, a furious debate, no matter how reasonably the bulk of people have, in the end, behaved, about where to from here. And the reason mm. it's really important to me is that I think after the great financial crisis, as Matthew Paris wrote at the time in your country, um, face it, we're broke. No one wanted to face the fact that collectively we had been irresponsible. We'd built up horrendous levels of public sector debt. Uh, the, uh, both that problem and the attempt to, uh, if you like, overcome it by creating inflation, which made people who held assets wealthier, but made it harder and continue to make it harder for young people who want to get into their first home or whatever, build wealth harder for them. It opens up a real fissure. The point that seems concerning to me is that we're not well prepared for this economic calamity, and it is a calamity, because we didn't pull yes. in the broader national interests in our individual countries uh, in, after the GFC. We will have to this time. We really will. So the sort of leadership we get will be very important. And there'll be those who want to play with new monetary theories and we can all pay ourselves whatever we like and just print more money. There'll be those who'll be saying, no, actually, this is a terrible hangover. We have to prepare for the next downturn. We've got to get our house in order. Who wins that debate, I think, will be incredibly important for the West. Absolutely. But you know, you know, you know very well that after the financial crisis of 2008, uh, countries which were, for instance, merely reducing public spending uh, in order to service the debt, among other things, were presented as going through periods of great austerity. I mean, remember the use of that word, austerity? Uh, austerity for a slowdown in borrowing, for instance, it would not seem to be austerity in the eyes of, of many economists and wouldn't feel like austerity in the eyes of many of the public. But yet that was what it was always presented as. You know, Britain was, was said to have gone through a period of great austerity. We didn't. We didn't. Yeah. Um, and... I, I, yes, I mean, I, I do worry, like a, a lot of us who would like to, you know, like to have responsible levels of, of borrowing and, and, and minimal levels of, of, of debt, uh, I do worry about what this leads to uh, in Britain, like other countries, inevitably. Our, our Chancellor has, um, our Conservative Chancellor and Conservative Government have approved a massive fiscal stimulus. And, and that may well be right at this moment. It's very hard to say how you could uh, um how you could allow the number of businesses including small businesses to go under the dark to go under um 
huge, you know, personally, uh, there are many, many people I know who are self-employed who are now facing incredibly tough times. Uh, key public workers will, in this one respect, be okay. But there are huge sections of the economy which just won't be. And the correct response probably is unusual. Uh, but yes, I can't say it doesn't worry me like it worries you because I I don't like to see the uh, the approval of um, the economics of delayed fantasy. We need to prepare ourselves for that debate. It will be a very very important one. The the the. What has been announced in Britain and in Australia and many other countries has been uh, often been called stimulus packages. They're not. They're rescue packages. They're necessary. You can hardly uh, leave people uh, without hope and without means of feeding and looking after themselves. Yeah. But the reality is that uh, in Britain uh, alone, uh, something like 15% uh, of GDP has just been added to your national debt. In Australia, we're not yeah. very behind already. Already, uh, and yeah. indebtedness is, is already threatening. Well, it was already threatening future generations of, of with yes. uh, absolutely unthinkable yes. levels of taxation. So, how yes. we have will require us next time not to shy away. I think for some very tough decisions, not to give up on the need to pull together. Yes. That's well, right. I, I, probably the only way to do that uh, again. You know better than me, but I thought politically the only way to do that is is to make it clear that what we're going through in this stimulus or rescue package is something we will have to pay for. Yes. You know, yeah. that, it, that it is, that it is, that this is the, 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 the bonus, but it will require a payback. There is something slightly immoral about uh, borrowing that you expect to be paid back by the next generation. And that that it is not that it is a it, it is not a it is not a decent way for a society to treat itself. I agree, uh, very very strongly. If, you, if we're not prepared to live within our means, and we rather stack uh, our uh, exalted ideas about how we should live against our children, we need to be asking ourselves tough questions. And this will throw up a lot of tough questions. That's a and, and by the way, so one other thing on that, which is the, 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 the basic presumption of it is that the, the next generation will not go through anything similarly challenging, isn't it? I mean, that is the, it's like when Britain indebted itself during the Second World War, it did so not just to survive, but in the presumption that this Second World War would be something which would not happen again and therefore the debt would be able to be paid through the succeeding decades. Uh, is anyone confident that something like the Wuhan uh, 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 coronavirus will not happen again in our lifetimes, let alone something similar happening in the lifetime of the next generation? You know, that would be you would have to have some kind of certainty like that to legitimately morally indebt the next generation. I take the point, and I think it's an incredibly important point. And we need to start to clarify our thinking around these issues. We have to assume there will be future shocks. And by the time this is over, we will have used almost all of the shots in the locker. You know, we've had incredibly low interest rates. We've had the printing of money in various forms and guises, liquidity everywhere. Uh, and we haven't wound back our public sector debts. Now we're about to act massively. And I don't want to say that we should despair, but I do want to say we, we will have to be more realistic and more honest than we were after the GFC, I personally, yeah. for our children and grandchildren's sake. Yeah. But that's a good segue into uh, British politics as it is today, uh, since we spoke the extraordinary victory by Boris Johnson uh, turns the electoral map on its head almost in Great Britain. Uh, what does that say about Britain? And, and does it mean now uh, that Brexit's settled, there's a new sense of unity uh, on the political front? 
uh, there is the crisis inevitably produces a certain amount of political unity, uh, at least a common purpose. Um, the election in December that already feels like a lifetime ago uh, did present this uh, extraordinary conservative victory. Uh, it's a um, it's it, it puts it puts Britain in a very good position for lots of reasons. We were in a in a horrible um, trap. It was like being uh, it was like trying to uh, uh, jump off a cliff and getting snagged on your shirt on a twig on the way down, like some like some cartoon character is, is what it felt like since the referendum and then the May government era and since having a, a strong government with an 18 majority in parliament means that, that there are all of these things that can happen. I mean, um, when, again, all this feels like from a different lifetime now, but when the Johnson government came in after December and put the EU withdrawal vote back to the Commons, you know, many of us had a sort of, PTSD like shiver. Oh no, they're putting the EU withdrawal bill back in front of the Commons. It'll be rejected again, of course. And of course, it passed <laughs> with, a, with a vast majority because the government had a vast majority. And all these people who we'd had to worry about in recent years deciding whether they personally wished to, uh, you know, uh, allow this bill passed. And all of that was over. And, uh, uh, and, and it, and it passed, and, and that's what it's been like. You know, legislation is being being passed, and that that has put us in a in a good position for lot in lots of ways. And uh, um, and indeed, Britain might be almost you know the best placed country politically these days in uh, in Europe certainly. Um, and uh, as I say, I mean, obviously everything can change at the moment. I mean, you know. As we speak, a new comes in. Angela Merkel has gone into self isolation. You know, and I mean, it's so. Who know, who knows what a strong or weak government looks like in the in the next few weeks, and whether that term is metaphorical or not anymore, um, uh, or, or purely political or not. Uh, but yes, um, uh, the 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 one additional rider it's worth saying is that the EU itself is once again under unbelievable pressure because of the the reassertion of the very thing that the EU since Maastricht has sought to overcome, which is the nation state. And during the current crisis, as with the migration crisis of 2015, which I wrote about in The Strange Death of Europe, we see this thing in which a political construct, whatever one thinks of it, a political uh, construct of the EU is is tested and indeed shown to be an ideological project whose practical boundaries are at least questionable by the fact that in the face of a crisis in 2015 and now in 2020, the nation states reassert themselves. Even in the face of the insistence that they wouldn't do so. You know, it is, it, it, it was not the EU that closed its borders. It was the announcement that Germany had closed its borders, that France had closed its borders, that Italy and Hungary and country after country closed their borders. It was in each case done as a unilateral action. And uh, as as everywhere in the world, um, you know, having having talked about, thought about, travelled throughout the whole issue of borders for some years, it's um, if you'd said to me a couple of years ago, what are the situ what are the circumstances in which Justin Trudeau announces that you know foreigners will not be allowed to Canada from tomorrow? Well, I can't see, I can't see how that happens. And lo and behold, it does. But there are very, there are very interesting things in this that, again, go back to this thing of, you know, the, my, my, my fear of, of, uh, of uh, any kind of prediction. But it, it is interesting that, the, that when societies are tested, they find where their natural points of 
resilience are and where its natural feeling of unity lies. This goes back to something you mentioned about Scruton earlier. This goes up back to something that Scruton wrote about a lot, which was um, what is what is the, the the widest, most legitimate form of the first person plural um, of what is the what is the best form of we? What do we mean when we say we? We is who? And we, the nation state, has historically been by, we all know it's not a, uh, it's by no means a fail safe. It's by no means, uh, uh, it's not exactly as if it, it's not something that can go wrong. You know, we, we all, anyone who knows history knows how the nation state can go wrong. It's not as if it's, it's the perfect answer to everything, but it is and will continue to be, and perhaps now will be reasserted as being, the widest way in which you can talk of we with legitimate feeling of ownership to things you yourself may not necessarily have contributed that meaningfully to an entity from which you can also draw something you can share so that you feel pride when that we does something well and indeed some shame if it does something badly but yes everywhere in europe everywhere in the world, the reassertion of the we of the nation state is one of the most remarkable things going on as we speak. I, 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 your insights are absolutely uh, undeniable. Uh, so, I mean, a simple way of illustrating that, I suppose, would be to say that an understandably worried Italian doesn't look to Brussels for the solution. They look well, to their own government. And look at how, and, and, and by the way, I mean, and that itself requires some leap of, of faith among the Italian people uh, um, for, uh, I don't be seem to be making some kind of um, anti-Italian point here, but I mean, uh, to put one's faith in the Italian government is, is uh, it requires what Kierkegaard may have referred to as a leap of faith. Uh, Italy is a country since the last war that was almost set up to be ungovernable. Uh, but it is very striking and quite right that the Italian people look to their government to do this because, once again, during this crisis, the supranational government of the EU actually tur has turned its back quite outrageously, in my view, upon Italy. And, uh, and this will, will teach its own lessons, not all of them by any means uh, uh, good. There are other signs. Uh, um, the president of Serbia the other day, extraordinarily, uh, 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 making remarks about how the EU, uh, which it has been, of course, seeking to join, had never been its true friend, and that actually its true friend that had come to its aid in its hour of crisis was China. Yeah. Now, these these are in 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 statements like this, which will have passed many people by. Uh, um, uh, uh, in statements like this, where the president of a country like Serbia claims that at this moment of crisis, it is China that has proved to be the true friend. In moments like this, one can see some of the fault lines in which the, the era after this crisis will be run along. And, you know, an enormous amount is going to depend on whether or not that line of thinking, that line of mercenary political and financial uh, thinking, whether that is, is properly tested and indeed contested or not. Well, that, that goes to the issue I was raising earlier. I think the debates we have after this will be very important. And another way of looking at this would be to say, presumably, hopefully, somebody will come up uh, with an antidote soon, uh, you know, with a, with a solution, uh, with an inoculation. Um, yeah, but the country in which that happens, I'm sure, will not be very keen on exporting it until they have enough for their own needs, their own people. And yes. that you will see, I would have thought, part of what is emerging, a, a, a clear acceptance that globalisation has its limits. Yes, I mean, it is... It, that is one of the things that we have... Um, we've talked about in recent years and haven't been very willing to acknowledge. Um, 
you know, some, it's, it's very interesting the way in which people talk about these things, which are, which uh, globalization as a term is, is one of those tricky ones, isn't it? Because it's, it can be, I would use it as a description of a, a demonstration, a description of facts, of the fact that we live in an unprecedentedly interconnected world. Some people, however, use globalization in, as meaning an ideological project. And it's, it's worth making clear which one of those one means. I think that the globalization of the first one, the, how I use it, the description of the interconnected world, um, is, which is a morally neutral point, I think, in a way. It's to say that that is neither a good nor a bad. It, it means that it has good and potentials within it, but like everything else in, in life, that it is, is a description of a natural state, will also have drawbacks. Well, to that extent, we are currently learning and seeing some of the drawbacks to globalization, just as, you know, I mean, every single one of these things, look at the advantages of technology, the advantage of technology that allows John Anderson and me to be talking literally on opposite sides of the planet is, to my mind, <laughs> a terrific good. But yeah. it, is the same, it is the same technology that can be used for terrible bad, for the pumping out of, of bad and untrue ideas. And, and it's the same globalization. Uh, to go back to, uh, on, on this theme, um, uh, how do we get the balance right? How do we ensure we think through as we move through this terrible crisis, where we want to go at the end of it. Of course, you talk about Serbia seeing China as its friend. Now, that is going to be the subject of some very heated discussions because uh, at, at one level, people are saying, well, that authoritarian uh, and, and uh, very uh, face-concerned regime let this mm. get out of control in the first place. On the other hand, You've now got everybody from the World Health Organization down saying, uh, well, China's done a marvelous job of containing it because they were able to, uh, you know, lock their place down effectively. Then you've got a, a war, if you like, between uh, China and America. China saying, you've denied us several weeks when we could have planned properly. Uh, China retorts by saying, well, the dysfunctional and immoral West can't handle it properly. Mm. Uh, these are going to be very interesting debates about uh, how yeah. free spirits, uh, how we pull together, yeah. even how we discern the way in which to capture the benefits of technology, of globalisation, of free trade, without sacrificing things like essential supplies of testing yeah. and um, what have you, uh, vaccines. I, I, a couple of things. First, I would say that in terms of Chinese self-reporting, as it were, I would, as I'm sure you would, treat it with an enormous degree of scepticism. I know nobody who does business in China who doesn't say that they don't believe any of the books that they're shown. You know, um, let's assume that just as the financial books in China are not to be trusted, so their statistics on this latest virus are not to be trusted. And uh, I think that, that would be my starting point. I mean, and again, it goes back partly to a political truth which we may have forgotten, which is that um, countries which have governments that are responsible and answerable to the people by and large are likely to be, in fact, I think in every situation, are able to be trusted more than regimes which are not remotely accountable to the people and who can cover up lies and perpetuate lies with zero consequence should they should they wish to do so so that's the first thing the second thing is i'm very struck by the fact as you, as, as you point out that, that, the, that there may be an axis that we're turning on here australia knows this i think better than any other country i've been very interested in recent years of watching the australian shift in opinion towards China, uh, something that's obviously gone on in New Zealand as well, and which has not gone on in the same way in, in Britain, for instance. It has in America. 
Uh, but we were just until this crisis, we were in Britain at this, in the, about to have a really meaningful discussion um, about the Huawei issue. Uh, and, and I thought that debate about whether Huawei was going to be allowed uh, to be a provider of 5G in the UK, I thought that was going to be the moment where we could have the discussion about China in the way which Australia has had it in recent years. And, and I suppose I would, uh, the way I think of this is that we were always on a balance act with China, which was we recognized its authoritarian nature. We didn't like it. We weren't wild about anything other than the financial benefit it could bring us. Now in that situation, what you do is, it's rather like, I don't know, a country allowing a lot of oligarchs from Russia to arrive. You have a sort of tipping point moment. On the one hand, you, you, don't, you, you like the fact there's a bit of fiscal stimulus that comes from very rich people spending basically dishonestly accrued money in your major department stores and that sort of thing. But at some point, there is an ethical price to pay for it. And in the case of China, which is far bigger than the, than the other example I just give, in the example of China, it seems to me the question was always, to what extent can we financially benefit from this arrangement? And what is the moment at which we, we stain ourselves in some greater way through this? So we were always in some kind of calibration of precisely when the moment might be that we knew, as it were, to put it in highly moralistic terms, that we were losing our soul in some way. And I wonder whether, I mean, again, it could, not, it could be the case that this has no impact on this, that the Chinese buy and PR and deflect their way out of responsibility for this and much more. Or it could be the point at which we realize what we should have been a bit more honest about all along, which is that there is a price to pay for doing the kind of deals that our countries had been willing to do with China. Well, it's very pertinent in Australia, of course, because they're our biggest trading partner and we are one of the very few countries in the world that runs a big trade surplus with China. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, regionally uh, affected uh, the... Uh, Militarization of coral, of, of, of coral atolls and so forth uh, to, to the north, uh, rebuilt islands, reclaimed islands, those sorts of things. Uh, they, you know, they, they do worry people. Um, I'm struck by something that Kissinger said a while ago. He said, in, in a contest between prosperity and freedom, um, a little trade lost can surely be regained. A freedom once lost can never be regained. Yes, that's right. That's right. Freedom is perhaps because, it's a bit like eyesight, isn't it? Until we've lost it, perhaps we haven't valued it properly. Yes. One of our more thoughtful parliamentarians recently commented that we should never have lost our understanding of the simple fact that a communist is a communist. In the end, a communist will behave as a communist does. And that leads really to the question of the breakdown of clear thinking about political ideologies. I wonder if I could be so rude as to ask you whether you think there's anything really terribly conservative about the Conservative Party in England today. <laughs> um, well, as I say, these are highly unusual times. There's nothing conservative about its spending habits at the moment. I'm, um, I'm sort of willing to give them, a, you know, a considerable leeway given the situation we're in. I mean or at least put it this way, were they to behave at the moment in an extraordinarily ideologically rigid conservative fashion when it came to the fiscal stimulus, it's possible not only that it would be exceptionally bad for the country, but a much less significant order of priority, um, not a particular boon to conservative, uh, the reputation of conservatism, shall we say. I mean, imagine if... A, a country like Britain at this point had government that said, no, and the certain principles dictate we must do X. And a load of people were, um, uh, you know, lost their houses and so on and had their homes repossessed. You know, I mean, there's, so I'm, I'm, um, 
I think the ideological scorecard, as it were, has to be very carefully marked at such times. Uh, but I take the point you make. Uh, um, of course, in every country, conservatism is different, isn't it? Because, among other things, you know, the left is different. Uh, because the uh, because the choice given to the British electorate last December was either Boris Johnson's Conservative Party or the Labour Party of Jeremy Corbyn. Boris Johnson's government looks incredibly conservative simply because, you know, well, not only because, but partly because it's not populated by, you know, Mao-loving Marxists who thought that, you know, broadly speaking, 1989 had been the saddest year of the 20th century. I mean, you know, we were facing, it's easy to sort of laugh about it now in a way, because we sort of saw the threat off, but, you know, we were facing a labour led by the most extreme political ideologues of the far, far left that the Labour Party had ever been led by in its, in its long and, and, and partly noble history. Uh, so um, from that perspective, Boris Johnson's government looks very conservative. Uh, I don't doubt at all that from other countries, including Australia at this moment, it doesn't look so. Um, but this is where we are. Well, uh, that immediately raises the question, I suppose, of where the Labour Party now goes as it uh, laboriously seeks a new leader. Yes, I mean, it's very hard to summon up any care for which of the sort of creations that have been offered to the Labour Party's uh, membership to vote for is, is, I mean, it, it, it is, as you mentioned, this has been rumbling on since the December election. Uh, uh, I mean, Keir Starmer is a is a is a uh, dislikable but relatively competent figure uh, who may well be the person who leads the party. As I say, it's hard to summon up much care for it. Uh, the rest of it, I mean, it, they all look like, including him, they all just look like to me like people who are playing an instrument that's gone out of fashion, you know, uh, or, or people pl playing some form of music long after interest in that form of music has passed, you know, and not a particularly good form of music either, I might add. You know, I, I these people who've been having weird ideological battles about the nature of what being a woman is, I just, you know, I just look at this in the current crisis we're in and think, I don't know what you're for, really. I don't, I don't know. I mean, maybe I can try to make it more positive by just saying that, you know, those of us who have lamented the lack of political talent in recent years have partly lamented it because this whole way in which, as you well know, we've set up our politics is... Is, is to set up a politics that deliberately avoids all of the most important issues and as a consequence involves itself in minimalistic, you know, deeply, deeply fringe issues. And as a result, the talent doesn't go into politics. And throughout my entire lifetime, I've, I've, I've wondered why the political talent has been so clearly drying up and and obviously you have to keep in mind that you know if you looked at the commons at any point in history you know there were remarkable people but most of the place was filled with you know not very remarkable people fine that, that that's the nature of things and you have to remind yourself of that in order not to get stuck in some false false memory syndrome nevertheless it's been striking to me throughout my adult life that, that there has been that when people entered politics in my lifetime, one thought less of them than one did before, which is exactly the opposite way round of how it should be. That if somebody became an MP, you thought, oh, that's sad. They were a person of promise before that, you know. And I and and that's because. 
that's because because the, the way in which politics had been set up in recent years in all of our countries meant who would go into it? I mean, increasingly, who would go into it if they were, you know, intelligent and had great ideas and, and um, you know, uh, were, were funny and talented and also capable of great depth? And, you know, because if somebody came to you and uh, such a person came to you and said, look, I'm thinking of going into politics, you know, and I know, you say, whoa, 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 that's a terrible idea. Uh, um, on day one, you'll say something, uh, 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 you know, that's true, and you'll be crucified for it. And you'll, on day two, you'll have to apologize. Later on in day two, you'll be hauled into the whip's office, and you'll be told never to do that again. And by day three, you'd be just like all the other guys in the parliament. And, you know, that's been the case for years. Um, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm interested through this crisis and after in how we can change that. And one way is to be more, more tolerant of the danger of ideas, which is something that's been much on my mind. You know, to recognise discussion is dangerous because you need to try things out. And that the enormous reduction of the acceptable political debate in our time has not been constructive in the end for our societies. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, I, I also think that the loss of commitment to particular political strands of thinking, you know, whether you call it the sort of Christian Democrat centre left, whether you talk about classic liberals, whether you talk about conservatives, whether in fact you talk about communists. Uh, once people lose a basis from which they mount their political campaigns out of conviction, out of a clear understanding of where they think the world should go, where their society should go, um, and the more they're up against people who have similarly lost their convictions from a different political perspective, the more you slide into managerialism. And, yes. and I think that is a great problem. And it's a segue into, um, uh, well, two things. The first is that perhaps this is changing. You tweeted recently, uh, you'd been at a speaking event, uh, and you tweeted, early in last night's event, there was a small disturbance, accusations of transphobia and other thought crimes. The entire capacity audience turned on the protesters who were escorted out very meekly. A pathetic protest which only proved my arguments and didn't bother me a jot. I, I thought that was encouraging. You must have been encouraged as well. Is there a degree of rationality returning to the public debate in view of the challenges we face and the absurdity of much of the public debate of recent years? Yes, I, th I suppose that that evening in question, uh, where I was on stage in London being uh, questioned on my last book by uh, Melanie Phillips, uh, I think possibly the combination of Melanie Phillips and me on the stage was just too much <laughs> for the, the, the tiny band of protesters um, uh, who were there. Uh, yes, um, I, 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 look, I, I think there are a small number of complete nutters. Uh, who I feel a sort of pity for as well as contempt, who, you know, have basically misread the whole world, misread what life is about, misread where you should find purpose in your life, misread everything to the extent that they think that, you know, they should try to shout me down, you know, good luck with that. Uh, that they should come to an event and try to shut me down by sort of whining in public uh, long before the Q&A started. Um, I think there's several things about this. Yes, I, was, I mean, I wasn't surprised, but yes, the entire audience turned on this rather pathetic little gaggle of protesters and they very meekly left. Um, uh, I mean, I, I mean I, the only thing that's interesting in a way is the fact that, you know, there is a broad feeling, I think, in a country like Britain, and I suspect it's now, it's been a little while, a year or more since I've been in Australia, I was hoping to come back soon, it looks like it might be a little while before I can, but I, and my sense is roughly the same in Australia, that a small number of people in our societies have had a disproportionate effect 
through being able to sort of bully and intimidate people. And by now, um, it's one of the, one of my sort of self-appointed tasks, not least in my last book. By now, uh, we've sort of undone quite a lot of that. You know, some of us have tried to expose what they've been doing, how they've been doing it, and how we can basically ignore them and uh, or take, if any points they've got of worth, take them and, and then, you know, invite them to move along. Um, uh, yes, I, I think that I think that there is also there is a distaste in general for hecklers, um, a, a distaste for people who think their own opinions are so important that they should turn up and try to interrupt people who people have come to hear, and you know shout over the rest of the audience. But but I mean I think the primary thing on this sort of thing is an attitudinal one. Quite a lot of people. That's why I, that's why I sent out that tweet. I very rarely tweet out anything as you know but um the attitude i would like to see is the one that i was doing that night it's not like it's supposed just with what i do uh, and what i mentioned is that is not to say oh my god there are people who don't like me or, oh my god there are people who disagree with me i assume that i assume that that's fine we should all assume that but I, I also think it's very important these people realize how deeply unbothered I am about their disagreement. You know, how deeply, deeply it does not concern me a jot. And that if they think that someone like me, or God knows, someone like Melanie Phillips is going to change her mind because of some, you know, pathetic little gaggle of, you know, well, they've got a hell of a lot of growing up to do. <laughs> but what a great thing that the audience, uh, you know, uh, reacted in the way that they did, because uh, I can't think of two clearer thinking people than you and Melanie Phillips. Uh, and I can't think of two people who ought to be heard more. Uh, but one other remarkable individual that you were very close friends with, uh, not well enough known in this country was Sir Roger Scruton, and he, his loss is a real loss for us all. Mm. It must have been a very sad event for you. Yes, it was. It's still very painful. Um, he uh, was a remarkable man, and he was, in my own life, he was extremely important for lots of reasons. One was he was one of um, several people when I was starting off who was enormously not just inspirational, but personally enormously important. Uh, Roger and I got to know each other, I was enormously lucky. Um, uh, uh, just as I was starting my career in writing about politics, I'd already written a book about literature, but uh, I was starting off again and was an intern at a small website which uh, used to try to bring ref left and right together at their best and argue the points, you know, at their real essence rather than, you know, the sort of, Punch and Judy, as it were. Um, of course, it failed. Um, and uh, but uh, but uh, the only conservative was Roger Scruton, and <laughs> who would very occasionally turn up at the office, and who I had started to read, and he he noticed that I seemed to be somebody with not entirely dissimilar views, and he said to me fairly early on, I was a lowly intern making a coffee and occasionally allowed to write a blog, you know, and. Uh, this is how, of course, you start off. And uh, uh, Roger said one day, he said, you probably worked out by now, Douglas. This whole thing is about 50,000 leftists versus us. So it's a fair fight. Um, and <laughs> and uh, thus a friendship was formed. And, uh, but that he was also one of those people who understood the deep importance, not just of... Uh, nurturing people um, in ideas and inspiring them, but the deep practical things that often mean as much, if not even more. You know, he would he would tell you that he had struggled a lot in his life and struggled a lot, particularly uh, um, through the years of sort of political wilderness that he'd lived in when his thinking was deemed to be wholly unacceptable, and he had found it very hard. To, 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 you know, basically to, you know, to, to live. 
And so he was very encouraging. You know, he would point out that this particular thing had come up and we had a small amount of money. If you did this, you could write for that and then you could use the money, Douglas, to do a book. And then, you know, so, and that's the sort of guidance, as you know, that actually it is um, sometimes almost as important as, as the personal and ideological inspiration that some people have. But that's just a personal thing. On, on, on either point, I mean, he... Um, he was a thinker who he 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 wrote uh, more than fifty books, I think. In the end, he he wrote on on aesthetics, on music, on political philosophy, on philosophy, on um, very specific thinkers. He wrote a remarkable book on Kant. Uh, he uh, was he thought not just about about philosophy, but about his education in the world. He thought about things that the world was lost sight of such as the significance of beauty in the world, a thing which we cannot do without, and yet we, we seem, have seemed for years to be willing to deprive ourselves of. And uh, he was a thinker who, as our mutual friend, uh, 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 Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, once said to me, uh, he was a thinker who in some ways seemed greater than the age. Um, and he, he uh, was... Uh, diagnosed with cancer very suddenly. Uh, um, he'd been uh, rather visibly ill, had a terrible set of shocks last year. Uh, he, I was very pleased to see he, 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 well, he came to my birthday, uh, my 40th birthday last July, and I think it was the last time he went out. He was diagnosed the next day, and he was very clearly, he had something that was wrong, and he had um, perhaps ignored it or had been distracted by other things and uh, he was given a very bad diagnosis and uh, he survived for another six months. It's an enormous personal blow um, and uh, a, a blow to an awful lot of people who looked to him as a source of guidance and as a rock in the midst of the turbulent oceans, not just of, of politics but of life. Um, because to a great extent, he not only thought about things, but lived them as well and demonstrated to other people how to live them. But, you know, um, I thought uh, at his funeral at Malmesbury in, uh, in uh, January, uh, what I think now, which is there are lots of ways in which we, 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 we think about and can think about friends and loved ones who died and obviously the religious have their own very you know um complex but consoling answers to this of which i don't die or, or or in any way uh, um reject but uh, the, the non-religious can have their own answers or at least not answers responses to this as well and and one which is on my mind sometimes is something that Martin Amis, the novelist, who, who Roger wouldn't have had very much, um, didn't have all that much admiration for, or love for, perhaps one might say. But Martin Amis once wrote in his memoir, Experience, which I think is his best book, he said, he talked about the death of one of his, his uh, relatives. And he said there, he talked about her funeral, and he said, um, he said um, how much everyone was feeling their departed friend and relative and uh what he what he amos said there is what I, I think of roger and what i think a lot of people were he said that um, this is where we go when we die into the hearts of those who love us um and uh, i think that's the case and everyone who loved roger and admired him and everyone who will go on to love and admire him and discover his work um part of him will go in them and um, they and we are all incredibly lucky people for that. A couple of points. Uh, one is uh, you've been very modest. You were a very, very good friend to him. He was outrageously maligned by some mm. of them simply because he was a conservative, misquoting his perspective mm. on a number of things. He lost a post to which he was eminently suited uh, as, as a national architectural uh, um, leader, uh, sacked by a conservative member of a so-called conservative government. Before they'd heard the evidence, you doggedly pursued 
the real transcript of what he'd said, which completely exonerated him. And I would yes. have would have made the person responsible for destroying his standing in that way because it hurt him very deeply. Want to do a very public mea culpa and, and change mm-hmm. their attitudes. But some people are very smug in their self-righteousness. I mean... Uh... I don't. I didn't mention only because uh, in, in Roger's wider legacy, I don't get to hover over it. But yes, I mean, it, in the last, some of his friends feel um, very bitter about this. Um, some people think that what the New Statesman and, uh, did to Roger in the last year of his life, uh, at the very least, distracted him from realizing what was happening to his body, and um, others put the blame more clearly on that. And um, I don't, I, I don't see anything about that. Just that is, that is something that a lot of people are angry about. The New Statesman under the editorship of Jason Cowley, yes, they lied about Roger. And uh, because I loved him and admired him uh, and respected him and I wanted to defend him and I did. And uh, as you describe, I um, managed to reverse the situation. Um, and I often worry of the number of people of perhaps less eminence who similar things have happened to who haven't had people to defend them in that way and the horrible injustice they must feel be it having their lives ridden over in that way by dishonest, disreputable figures. I, um, I don't like to sort of, as it were, the deepest level morally judge what's in someone's soul, but I cannot understand how somebody could live with themselves if they'd, after they'd done what those journalists tried to do to Roger. And I, um, you know, and the editor of that magazine in particular, who I, I have met and I thought to be a relatively decent man, to th- how you could live with yourself to know that if it hadn't have been for somebody else exposing what you'd done, Roger would have gone to his grave with his reputation in tatters. And I don't know how they live with themselves for that, knowing that they had spread untruths and knowing that those untruths had an impact in the world, had a deep impact on a man's and his family's life. Um, you know, it's not for me to judge, but I, I cannot understand how somebody can live with themselves and not feel, at the very least, the desire to deeply, humbly, and genuinely beg forgiveness yeah. for such uh, behaviour. Thank you for that response, because I think what you've just said is very powerful and very, very important for all of us to consider. You know. We're, we're all capable of doing the wrong thing. We all need to be warned uh, mm. that uh, when we do, we need to own up, not run away. But you've been very generous with your time. I sincerely hope you do make it to Australia when we're all free to move again. And, and two final uh, sort of great questions that you put up there. One's related to Sir Roger Scruton as a great thinker. Uh, I hope people read him more widely look at those interviews, the talks you yourself had with him. His thinking's quite powerful, very challenging. And it's always put, uh, as a perfect gentleman, uh, uh, ought to put these things, you know, with courtesy, uh, with consideration, which is something the world, I think, is actually craving. I really do. The majority of want that sort of measured approach. Uh, but those great ideas are very important. The other thing that I think you've set before us is a great challenge is what do we do, not just to encourage the flow of big ideas back into the public square, how do we encourage really good men and women? We, have, we do have quite a few of them in Australia, but we need mm. who are prepared to run the gauntlet and put their hand up for the most noble of all uh, uh, public service positions, those of elected yeah. uh, representatives, so decried, but so unbelievably important. If we keep going at this rate, our, our, our cynicism will become a self-fulfilling prophecy and, and we won't have anyone who's committed yeah. to this leading us. 
Well, the, 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 it's a two-way process. The first is that it demands people uh, to step forward themselves. And the second that is it, that it demands the public to have a different attitude towards what our political representatives are meant to be. If we agree the game is catch them out in something they did or didn't say and then pummel them, or take one example, the gaff. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the gaff. Uh, uh, which people are found to be guilty of, very often a gaffe is saying something true, which you're not meant to have said. Well, how about we just have an agreement that when somebody says something true, they are not to be punished for it. <laughs> uh, that's a good place to start. And the press and the public, that's in our hands. You know, it's in our hands. Not to, Look at another one, the U-turn. We've all seen this in recent days. They've been pathetic. You know, self-appointed virologists who, you know, were previously just hacks, you know, who, who say, oh my gosh, the government has U-turned. When did the U-turn come in as this? I, if I, I only learned to drive in the last year. I can tell you, if I'm driving for in, straight into a wall, I stop and I do a U-turn. It's, it's not... It's again, it's not a morally always determined move. It's, it's a perfectly reasonable maneuver in the face of certain circumstances. It isn't, even if a government has genuinely done the so called U turn, it isn't a sign of, you know, imbecility necessarily. It might be very wise. It might, so, so there are these games that are played and that are imposed on it. How about we? You know, as I say, I have confidence in the British government. Uh, I have confidence in the Australian government. And I have, I have confidence that if they change their mind on something in a difficult era, in an unprecedentedly complex situation, you know, it isn't because they've sort of U-turned or shown themselves to be in some way more aligned, but simply that they're trying to do their best in a horrible situation. And that we should have the a degree of tolerance for that. And so, as I say, this is a reciprocal thing between the public and their politicians. Um, on the wider issue, I think that particularly at a time like this, this is, this is a deep moment to draw, as we said at the very beginning, on our reserves. I, uh, I think of something that uh, Leo Strauss said to his students, uh, at Chicago, I think it was, on the death of Winston Churchill, when, when the, the announcement came of the death of Winston Churchill. And actually, I, I actually just pulled out the, 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 the reference, I got it in front of me. He's, Strauss said on the occasion of Churchill's death, he said, he said, we have no higher duty and no more pressing duty than to remind ourselves and our students of political greatness, of human greatness, of the peaks of human excellence. Now, we have at the moment in our <laughs> self-isolation, um, an opportunity to demoralize ourselves or an opportunity to, among other things, remoralize ourselves. We have the opportunity either to wallow in self-pity or to dig deeper and to do better and uh, you know, I, I think that all of our countries have deep wells that we can draw upon. Australia has an exceptionally, extraordinarily deep well of people, of thinkers, an incredibly rich tradition, uh, which it can draw on, a tradition in literature, in art, and much more. And maybe we could use these days meaningfully by re-engaging with that. You know, we've just been talking about Roger Scruton, but another friend of mine who died since we last spoke, I was less close with, but, but, but knew pretty well, particularly in recent years, was Clive James. And I adored Clive. And uh, my gosh, Clive alone uh, produced a, a, a library of books and a wealth of knowledge and thought, deep thinking as well as what he's perhaps better known for, which is his incomparable humour and ability to make life happier. Um, you know, 
this is another great, great person, a great figure. And, you know, um, you could have a whale of a time as well as a very, very significant uh, time in the coming days if you just reached to the shelf and got some of Clive's books off, you know, and there are so many others uh, that one can think of. So I suppose what I think is let's, let's use this time well and draw well upon it. Well, thank you so very much for that encouragement because in a sense, that's precisely why I wanted to talk to you tonight. Uh, we need to use this opportunity grim as the circumstances that have provided it might be, to do some hard thinking because there will be big, big decisions to be made at the end of it and we're going to need the right people to lead us through it. I sincerely hope you do get to Australia in a not too distant future uh, and I sincerely hope that plenty of people get to hear what you've got to say, including particularly those who will have to lead us forward out of this current malaise. Well, it's Thank been an enormous pleasure. All the best. Look forward to seeing you in person again. And to you, John. Take care. Thank you for watching this episode. We appreciate your support. If you value vital conversations like this one, be sure to subscribe to the channel there and also click the notification bell to stay up to date with new releases.